Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Maryland Democratic Party's Gubernatorial Candidates Forum, a conversation on education. We originally scheduled this as an in-person event, but out of an abundance of caution, we chose to do it virtually. However, we will be scheduling. However, we will be rescheduling the in-person event at a later time. Stay tuned for more details. We'd like to thank our sponsors, GS Proctor and Associates, and Jim and Tracy Ratchiff. And thanks to everyone watching us tonight on Facebook Live. We are thrilled to be joined by seven of our Democratic candidates for governor. And our moderator tonight is Daniel Gaines, editor of Maryland Matters. Daniel Gaines covered government and politics for Maryland Matters for two years before moving into an editing position. Previously, she spent six years at the Frederick News Post as the paper's principal government and politics reporter for half of that time, covering courts and legal affairs before that. She also reported for the now defunct, the Gazette of Politics and Business in Maryland. We are thrilled to have her with us this evening. So Danielle, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight for this important discussion about education that has become all the more critical during this pandemic. We might not be able to get together in person in my beloved Frederick, uh, but I do hope that everyone is nice and comfortable at home. We are going to try to cover a lot of ground tonight. Each candidate will have one minute and 30 seconds to answer questions from me. We will rotate which candidate gets to answer each question first. During the discussion, we invite members uh, viewing this on Facebook to submit your own questions through the chat function. And we will ask those at the end. Candidates will have one minute each to answer those questions. At the end, each candidate will have one minute for closing remarks. Now let's get to it. Joining us tonight are uh, Roshan Baker, former Prince George's County Executive, John Barron, a former Clinton administration official, Doug Gansler, former Maryland Attorney General, Ashwani Jane, a former Obama administration official, John King, former US Education Secretary, Wes Moore, former nonprofit CEO and author, and Tom Perez, former US Labor, Labor Secretary and DNC Chair. Um, let's launch right into it. <laughs> um, we know that the pandemic has increased the stresses and traumatic experiences of our children and what they bring to school with them every day. Um, it impacts learning and safety. It is compounded by the stresses and traumas that we know our educators are experiencing as well. Um, the first question is going to go to Mr. Baker. What's, what specific steps would you take to address these challenges and support our school communities? You have one minute and 30 seconds. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Daniel, for the question and thank uh, the party for having us here today. You know, I've talked to a lot of teachers around the state and this has been the hardest uh, experience for the teachers and for the students because many of the students who are already behind have fallen further behind. And so what we have to do as a state is support those teachers and our students the best way that we can. Uh, many of our students who were logging on uh, to teaching virtually uh, didn't have the ability to log on to have a tutor there. So one of the things that I like as in the current commission is the ability to have tutors and mentors for not only our students, but our teachers. But we have to provide the support at the state level. What I see is inaction from our um, state superintendent or our school state school board to help out at the local level. And so what I want to do as governor is the same thing I did as county executive, is to be engaged with the local school board and the superintendent to make sure we're providing the tools our students need. We know that they're going to need extra uh, help in reading and math, um, that parents are going to need extra help uh, to make sure those students come up to speed. And so I want to make sure that we have a system that's not only providing, especially now that we have federal resources that we can put toward this, that we help um, the students uh, really just move up. And so that's what I would do as governor. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Mr. Barron. 
Thank you, uh, Danielle. Um, so in response to COVID, first of all, this is an unprecedented public health crisis. Um, I, but I think it, is a, it would be a mistake, and it is a mistake to close schools and go back to, to remote learning. Um, I think the state working with districts should do whatever is humanly possible, except under dire circumstances to get kids back into classrooms and make sure they stay there. Uh, because the costs of being out of the classroom are enormous, especially for young kids. I mean, trying to learn in front of a computer, a first and second grader, are you kidding me? Um, also kids from disadvantaged backgrounds who may not have a computer or a good computer or internet access. So it is enormously damaging and it's more damaging than the risk of being in the classroom. So here's what I would do. I called back in August for something we should do now, a vaccine requirement for all teachers, school staff, and students age 16 plus, because that can keep lots of people healthy. Number two, um, we, can, we should have vaccine clinics in all of, the, uh, all of the schools within the state. We need to get our vaccination rate up from 50% where it is now up to 95%. Finally, I agree with Rush Earn. We need to expand tutoring to create to, uh, to all struggling students, especially in the early grades, because that has been shown to be extremely effective at reversing COVID-related learning loss. Those would be my top priorities. Thank you. Mr. Gansler. Thank you. Um, and thank you for hosting this for the Democratic Party. And obviously, always great to be at least virtually in Western Maryland. Um, after two years of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, our school system is indeed in crisis. And there's really no words to adequately describe the environment within which our teachers have had to teach, our staff members have had to work, our children have had to, had to learn, and our parents have had to provide support. So the effects of remote learning have been catastrophic for students across the social and economic spectrum, and particularly devastating for those from working and low to moderate income families who've been hampered from the start by inferior learning technology, a vast digital divide and inadequate childcare options. So one of the uh, major things I would do along with mandatory vaccinations and, and, and keeping the schools open with masks optional certainly for, for teachers and staff is to make sure we, um, if you, and you can go to our website, dougansler.com uh, and look at our mental health matters. We're making mental health a centerpiece of of our campaign and what we're what we're talking about doing is making sure that in every one of our over 1400 schools that we have a mental health professional in those schools for one mental health professional for each two up to 250 students so the children have adequate access to mental health concerns and have someone to talk to about the stress that they're undergoing thank you uh, mr james well, first, thank you so much for having me and for putting this together. I was actually just in Frederick yesterday, so I was really hoping to meet all of you all in person today. But for safety reasons, I'm happy that we're still doing this and, and doing it virtually. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to COVID, right, when I speak with students, with parents and with educators, the biggest concern that keeps coming up is safety. And so that's why my focus has been on getting everyone fully vaccinated, boosted and mandating masks. In the meantime, I believe we need to have each of our school boards do an analysis of each school within their districts to determine where the riskiest schools are and if it's safer to either isolate those who are sick or to move to virtual learning. And while remote learning is definitely not the preferred option, if the decision comes down to moving to virtual for a specific school or district, again, with the sole intent of keeping everyone safe, then I think we need to also make sure we're providing equal and full broadband access to every student and every educator. And I know for a lot of folks in low-income communities in Western Maryland and Southern Maryland on the Eastern Shore, that access to broadband was a really big issue uh, when we originally went to remote learning. And so making sure that we're reducing those barriers needs to go hand in hand with this risk analysis. Thank you, Mr. King. Thanks, Danielle, for the question. And thanks to the party for hosting this event. Look, I, I'm a Montgomery County Public Schools parent. I've lived the challenges of the last two years. It's been incredibly difficult. And, and we have a lot of resources. And it's been really hard uh, for our kids, the disruptions to learning, the isolation from friends and teachers. 
Um, I'm glad kids are in school this year. We need to do everything we can to keep them safely in school. And it's really frustrating as a parent that the governor didn't do more to prepare for this moment that we should have seen coming. Uh, we should have N95 and KN95 masks for all staff and students, but we don't. We should have testing so that kids can test negative before returning to school, but we don't. Uh, we should have done more to prepare for this moment. We should have a massive effort to close not only the vaccination gap, but the booster gap. We're seeing an emerging racial gap in access to boosters. So the governor has failed to mobilize folks. Local leaders are stepping up. I was glad to see uh, Mayor Scott in Baltimore commit to uh, mass and tests. I was glad to see the Baltimore Teachers Union working to try to get masks, but this should have been addressed by the state. And now going forward, we've got to focus on tutoring and mental health services to try to make up for the impact of the last few years. But we got to do all we can to keep everyone safe. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Thank you so much, and, and good evening, and it's great to be with all of you. And, and, and thank you for this question, because I think this is a direct reflection uh, of not just an exacerbation of the challenge, but frankly, uh, an exposure of many challenges that we have had before, uh, where we have not had an education system that is fully preparing and protecting both our children and also our educators and paraeducators in this process. You know, I, I come from a long line of preachers and teachers. Uh, I, I have family members, aunts, cousins who are teachers right now in Maryland. And I can tell you right now, that this has been an amazingly frustrating period, not just because of the fact that we are dealing with measures of inconsistency in the virus, but we're also watching a lack of clarity as to how we're going to deal with these issues. You know, we have federal resources to be able to deal with this. What we need right now is state leadership that is actually going to specifically earmark and be clear and specific about how we have to move forward. We know there's so much that should have been done, uh, but we know that going forward, we need to focus on things like making sure that we are giving teachers a fair pay for the work that they are doing. We already had teachers who were underpaid for the work that they are doing, and we needed to address that. The heroic work that they were doing has been undervalued. That we need to add mental health supports for both our students, our educators, and our paraeducators in everything that we do. It's one of the reasons I'm proud of the work that Baltimore City did last year with passing the Elijah Cummings Healing Cities Act, where it's basically uh, saying that every department you. has to be able to address these issues. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Perez. Um, Mr. Perez, you need to unmute. My bad. You'd think after a year and a half, you'd figure this one out. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, I think there's a lot of agreement uh, among us on what we need to do. Safety has to be job one. We want to do everything possible to get people, kids back to school, but we want to make sure we're doing it safely. We've seen so many shortcomings from the governor. You know, when Prince George's County announced that they were going virtual, the governor immediately criticized it. Well, the dashboard that you needed to know, to, to use to uh, go after and make important decisions was down. So governor, please don't criticize Prince George's County when you're not doing your job, because that was wrong. One thing I would do right away is I would make sure that we uh, enact and implement a hazard pay law for teachers and other local government employees. I, I called upon um, Governor Hogan to in, expand and in, um, keep the hazard pay for state workers going. It expired December 31st, but I think we should expand it. And the reason why is I want to say to teachers, I want to say to corrections officers working at a local level, bus drivers, we care about you. This stinks right now, but you're putting your lives in the line. We want to say to parents, we're going to make sure that there are mental health um, professionals there to help you, to help teachers. We're going to make sure we're saying to everybody around the state that we are doing our level best during this pandemic to keep you safe and to keep us moving forward. That's what I would do. Thank you. Um, and so if it hasn't become apparent, we're going to be going alphabetically in a round robin fashion. So um, one of the frustrations that parents have had over the last 18 months is a sense that they don't have enough input in their child's education. How would you ensure a collaborative partnership between parents and teachers to affect the best outcomes for our children? 
And how would you balance the desire for parental input in curriculum with respecting the expertise that we know educators bring to our classrooms? Uh, Mr. Barron, you'll be first on this. Yes, thank you, Danielle. Um, I believe parent input is extremely important that educating a child is a joint venture. It's a joint partnership between parents, schools, um, and the community. And so I absolutely uh, think parents have input on the curriculum. Now, one area where it's been controversial, um, I know in Florida has been in critical race theory. That's an area where it came up. Um, and I think that uh, parents absolutely should have input um, in that and other areas. Um, and um, my view on that is that schools should be teaching the truth. And that's something that, um, uh, that parents and that uh, teachers and that students should all be debating and uh, seeking to find. So that should be a balance. Um, we should be teaching, uh, uh, you know, uh, the stain on, of slavery on, uh, on American democracy when it was born, but we should also be teaching that we've made major progress on civil rights and also that uh, American democracy, uh, America has had an enormous impact on the world in advancing freedom and civil rights. So that's one example, but that's an area where I think everybody needs input and we all ought to be focused on the truth as the central guiding uh, input. Thank you. Mr. Gansler. Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I, the, the, the focus ought to be and should be and always will be on the child and on the student and, and on education. It's our most valued resource that we have in Maryland is our education system. And we really had a gold standard education system for a lot of folks, but not for everybody, not depending on what uh, county you live in, what jurisdiction you live in and what zip code you live in. Your school may not be as good your, uh, and, and even as a place to go to school, but parents absolutely have to have an input. I'll give you an example. When I was attorney general, we uh, started a program called Clicks. Which was, uh, which was brought to us by parents. Parents were concerned about what their children were doing online in social media, uh, Facebook and uh, Google and all the other big tech companies. And so we worked collaboratively with parents and brought programs to schools to teach children how to, how to do that. We worked with EverFi, a nonprofit, uh, or, well, nonprofit company to help educate children. Literacy training uh, is something that came to us from parents that they wanna see in their schools as well, which led, of course, the lack of literacy training led to the national mortgage foreclosure crisis, which I was able to lead as the head of all the attorneys general of the United States to bring almost $2 billion into Maryland to keep people in their homes. Uh, vocational training, people wanna see access to that because not everyone can go to an Ivy League school or wants to, they wanna be able to get a job. So there's a lot of input that we need to hear from parents and we need to support our teachers and pay them more. Thank you, Mr. Jane. Yeah, thank you again for the question. So as someone who has worked in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, I really understand how to build coalitions, which I think is what this question really pertains to. How do we engage parents, educators, et cetera? Um, and so by not only including parents and educators in the decision-making process, but also students uh, from day one of each of our operations, not just when we're discussing elections or budgets or curriculum, but really engaging them before, during, and after all these decisions are being made. And that's why I've actually built my campaign the way I have. I'm the first statewide candidate in the nation to be 100% volunteer run, where residents from every county are making the policy and strategy decisions. So when you go to janeforgovernor.com, for example, and look at my education platform, every policy and decision that I've put out there was made in partnership, hand-to-hand, -hand, with parents, with educators, and with students from each of our counties. And I think that is the kind of approach and the kind of leadership that we need in the governor's office. Thank you, Mr. King. Yeah, it's such an important issue. When I was a high school teacher and middle school principal, it was always a priority for me to make sure that our school partnered effectively with parents to support their kids, to support their academic development and their socio-emotional development. And one of the things I love about the Blueprint for Maryland's Future and the investments there is making all of our schools that have large numbers of low-income students 
community schools where there'll be someone in charge with the responsibility to make sure that the school is partnering with community-based organizations to support families, whether that's around mental health services, access to help finding housing, access to help addressing food insecurity. That, that's critically important. But I also want to address something in your question, this question around curriculum. And I think we can all be confident that Kelly Schultz says the, if she's the Republican nominee or Dan Cox, they will try to use critical race theory as a dog whistle wedge issue. And we, we have a statewide ad on, on this issue because I think it's important that we confront that dog whistle directly and say clearly, we need to teach the truth of our history. I'm sitting in Silver Spring, Maryland, about 25 miles from where my great grandfather was enslaved in Gaithersburg, Maryland. That happened, that's real. It is also true that my family went in three generations from enslaved in a cabin in Gaithersburg to serving in the cabin of the first black president. That is also real. And we have to tell the story of the truth of our history, the hard parts and the progress. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Thank you. And as a, as a parent uh, myself of two school aged kids, uh, I believe that parents should be very active in the decisions made at their kids' schools. Uh, I also, though, believe that that is not just exclusively uh, decisions that are being made on behalf of curriculum decisions. Uh, I, I do believe that when we're talking about the building and the investment of community schools, that we're not just talking about curriculum, but we are also talking about the importance of dental care and eye care and uh, treating kids and supporting students who are coming to school with asthma, that all of the holistic realities of our children have to be factored in and that parents should be part of that conversation. You know, I, I had a sign that sat over my desk uh, in my office when I, I ran one of the largest nonprofit organizations in America. And the sign uh, simply said that the people who are closest to the challenges are the ones who are oftentimes closest to the solutions. We have very strong parent associations across the state. And I'm committed to ensuring that our parent groups are fully engaged and seen as partners as we work together to build a world-class public education system. And I think it becomes imperative uh, and as Maryland's next governor, I will bring everybody, parents, educators, students, everyone to the table to make sure we're developing solutions that are in the best interest of our students, but that's not exclusively a curriculum conversation. It's being able to find every single challenge that's standing in the way of their development and making sure that we are being aggressive in the way we're addressing it. Thank you, Mr. Perez. I served on the Montgomery County Council uh, for four years and over half of our budget was schools. And my children went to Rolling Terrace, a, a, a school that has about 60% of the students are economically distressed. What I learned about parental involvement was we have to understand that not every parent can go to a PTA meeting at eight o'clock at night. Why? Because they're working two, three, four jobs to make ends meet. And so we need to meet parents, all parents, where they are. That's so critically important. We also need to make sure that students have a seat at the table. You know, what I hear from students around the state is, we need to redouble our investments in career and technical education. I'm hearing a lot about offshore wind and I, I see these $30, $40 an hour jobs that are in our future. And I think we need to listen to that. And, and what I like about the blueprint is you see those investments in career and technical education that are embodied in the blueprint. And, and that's critically important moving forward. We know that there are so many communities right now that are underserved, that have high farms rates, free and reduced meal eligibility. And so what we have to do is make sure that we are meeting them where they are. In Rolling Terrace, one of the things we heard was that we need a school-based health clinic. And so when I was council president, we dramatically expanded the number of school-based health clinics in uh, the most impacted communities. That's what I'll do as governor. Make sure everybody, students, parents, communities have a seat at the table. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Thank you. Um, there's been some really good ideas uh, put forth by the, uh, the panel here. Let me just say, I started my public career in Prince George's County as a PTA uh, president of my son's school. And my wife and I were always active in our PTA. Uh, the first thing parents want is safety in their schools. The second thing is uh, quality instruction and challenging uh, instruction. And we want our schools to be inviting. I like to visit my child's school when, um, when they were uh, in, in school. The other thing is some of the stuff that's been said, I just want to echo, um, you know, 
Mr. Moore talked about dental and health and mental health in our schools. And that's something that's vitally important, which is why as county executive, we expanded the number of mental health and, and dental and, and healthcare in our schools. We also, when we revamped our um, school system here in the Prince George's County, we had a, a part of the legislation dealt with parental uh, coordinator. So we make sure that parents are engaged. Um, it's also something I will do as governor that I did as county executive is I not only would visit schools, but I also made sure that I was visiting PTAs. So they had a chance to, to upfront talk to me parents. Because I know that's what I liked as a parent, to be able to talk to the representatives and those who are making decisions to make sure my voice is heard. And so as governor, I would do the same thing. Thank you. I just wanna say that everyone's doing good, keeping to the time clock so far, so we can keep that up and then you'll be able to hear from more voters. Um, to everyone watching the live stream, remember that you can submit questions in the chat function. Uh, we are going to turn our attention now to a few questions about the blueprint for Maryland's future. The blueprint will be transformative for our schools and our students. And we know that its, implement, its implementation will require a lot of work, attention, and support. Specifically, how will you work with local governments to ensure that there is full funding for implementation of the blueprint at the state and county levels? How will you ensure that the entirety of the blueprint is funded? Uh, first, we're gonna to go to Mr. Gansler on this one. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. And given its existential importance to our state's quality of life, uh, I'm glad that all the candidates that did choose to appear tonight um, actually favor the Kerwin law and, and some will mention the people that are not here um, and their, their position on that. But I, I will say that it's, it's incredibly important and, and why it's important to get it passed is because uh, it will revolutionize and, and change education going forward. The, the General Assembly put together the, the Kerwin Commission and, and established the blueprint be, uh, by getting the best and the brightest together to, to put it into one place where we have universal pre-K, paying our teachers more, getting the highest of education, making sure we bridge the, uh, the equity gap, the education gap, that we make sure all zip codes have, have new schools and improved schools. And being somebody who's actually led matters, experience matters, along with Rashawn Baker, um, you know, we, we've led, we've actually had executive jobs in government and we've actually made things happen. And so I think that that's going to be critically important because this is a, a gargantuan project with a lot of tentacles, but it's, it's a critically important one. And having the relationships with the General Assembly, understanding how to lead in times of crisis, working the levers of government uh, is going to be critically important. And actually having a Democrat win that can win the general election is even more important for the future of Kerwin. Thank you. Mr. Jane. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So at the end of the day, a budget is all about priorities. And that's why with my campaign, we prioritize education with a comprehensive policy memo that builds on print since January of 2021, all at janeforgovernor.com. After all, I am a product of Maryland public schools. I also attended a Title I elementary school with uh, mold on the ceilings, a lot of great educators who just didn't have the resource they needed. A few years after that, when I was in middle school and 13 years old, I was actually diagnosed and treated for a type of cancer. And I remember how the entire ecosystem of my school, that's everyone from the bus driver to the cafeteria lady, to my teachers, to my fellow students, even the physical building itself felt like my safe place where I felt supported and taken care of. And so build on that uh, perspective, I think is why I would prioritize funding for the blueprint and also making sure we're going beyond that making sure that regardless of where you live in this state, that you have equitable school funding, that you have after school programs, you have great educators, those educators and those teachers have pair educators and support staff who can help them reduce class sizes, making sure we're also looking at the issue of education in a comprehensive way. So also addressing infrastructure and affordable housing. Uh, again, we have to look at these issues from a really sincere and methodical way. And that's what I plan to do as governor. Thank you. Mr. King? You know, the stakes on this are really high. When schools are under-resourced, it has a deeply harmful effect on kids' education 
emotional well-being. It means mm -hmm. schools where there aren't enough school counselors. It means schools where kids can't take advanced placement classes. It means teachers who can't afford uh, to focus on their classroom because they have to juggle multiple jobs because they're they're not being paid enough. So we, we need the investment of the blueprint and we need a governor who will follow through on that investment. The good news is that with the good revenue picture in the state and the federal funding that's come in, the blueprint is largely paid for over the next few years. But long term, we need a governor who's willing to look at the revenue side as well to make sure the resources are there to deliver on the blueprint and build on it with universal affordable child care birth through five. And that's going to mean taking a look at tax fairness. Yes, we should legalize cannabis and that will be a revenue source, but at the end of the day, we're gonna to have to tackle tax fairness. It is wrong that people who make over a million dollars a year are paying a lower, uh, lower percentage in taxes than middle income folks. It is wrong that people who own small businesses are paying a higher percentage in taxes in, in many cases than large corporations. Uh, we're gonna to need to look at tax fairness to make sure that the revenues are there to fund the blueprint and build on it. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you very much. Sorry, Danielle, we just need to um, uh, pause for a minute. We're, we're having some technical issues. So Lewis is working on that in the back end. Uh, we'll let you know when we're, we're ready to go. Sure, no problem. clear on this answer. Uh, as your governor, I am committed to fully right, Danielle, funding. Danielle, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you. We're going to uh, resume our answers on the question of funding the blueprint with Mr. Moore. Thank you so much. And, and, and I want to be crystal clear on this. Uh, as your governor, I'm committed to fully funding the full implementation of the blueprint. Uh, we will not retreat on this because every child in Maryland has the right to an education that prepares them to succeed in the future. And it's in the best interest of all of us. You know, when I testified in Annapolis with, with, with many of you, uh, working with lawmakers, working with legislators, fighting to ensure the passage of the blueprint, I remember the fact that I first felt handcuffs on my wrist when I was 11 years old. You know, I know what it's like to struggle, and I know the challenges that many of our students are facing, and I know the role that access to a quality education played in my, my own future. Every child in the state deserves that chance. And so when people say that Maryland has a world-class education system, my answer always is, which kids and in which neighborhoods? So the fact that my career has taken me to the battlefield leading soldiers in combat and has taken me to the forefront of efforts to lift people out of poverty I know that it is because we've had a data-driven and heart-led approach to this, and the data is very clear, that failing to fully fund and implement the blueprint is failing not only our children, but it's failing the future of Maryland. And so I understand there are going to be significant financial commitments, 
that are both to come from the state and locals, and it's required to fully fund the blueprint. But I know that we can do this together. And so as governor, I will bring every local jurisdiction leader to the table and to chart a path forward to meet our funding commitment to our students, but we will not retreat from this. Thank you. Mr. Perez? Budgets are moral documents. They reflect the values of a community. I will fully implement, you can look at what we did when I was on the county council. Education was over half of our budget because we understood that the benefits of an educated workforce, it was a civil rights imperative, it was an economic imperative, it was a moral imperative, and it was an imperative for everyone. That's what I will do. This has been a long journey, this journey on education in Maryland. I remember the Thornton Commission. Rashern remembers the Thornton Commission, the P to 16 Council. So much work was done. And what is re so remarkable about this commission and what we've done now is that there's an, a, there's an accountability and implementation board. The first thing I would do if I were governor today is I would fund it. The governor has refused to provide funding so the implementation board can get to work. That's wrong. He should get on that. We should fund this. I know, Governor, that you vetoed the bill. You don't like it. But you know what? It is the law, and you need to enforce the law. That's the first thing I would do, is make sure we are funding it right now, because that is the key. And, and, and you have to look, when you're looking at the candidates' implementation, whether it's this, whether it's offshore wind, whether it's clean energy, healthcare, implementation is the whole ball of wax. And I have pr a proven track record across local, state, and government, and federal Thank government you. of getting things done. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Mr. Baker? Let me just add on to uh, what Tom said, because he's absolutely right about the governor uh, not funding uh, this bill. Uh, by not funding, by vetoing, the governor delayed the current commission by two years. And so now, and that's before COVID hit us. So now we're getting at a time where kids are even further behind. I also want to um, echo what uh, Mr. King said about the, you know, about uh, uh, the local jurisdictions having to provide funding for uh, the ongoing cost of this. The money is not there, you know, right now. It's there for a few years. Those of us who are around during the Thornton Commission remember that the big thing about Thornton was not that we didn't pass the legislation, is that we couldn't get the funding from it from the governor's office. So one. Very proud of the fact that I didn't wait for the uh, current commission. Mm -hmm. We actually started raising revenues for education in Prince George's County during my second term as county executive. That's what every jurisdiction around the state is going to have to do. I like what we're doing with the current commission in, in the fact that um, we're going to be able to have folks, 13 staff members, if the governor ever funds it, that will work with all 24 jurisdictions to make sure they're doing the things the, Thornton, the uh, current commission calls for increasing teacher pay, um, nationally board certified teachers that are working in high needs areas, all of those things that are important. But just think about it. We had to create, the legislature had to create a task force because the governor's school board could not do it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barron? Thank you. My approach on blueprint implementation is very different than the other candidates. Here's the big picture. When it comes to education in Maryland, we are stuck. More than a quarter of middle school students in our state cannot read at a basic level. More than a third can't do basic math. Those numbers and other achievement numbers are no different than they were 20 years ago. And that's true even though Maryland saw a major rise in education spending, a 40% rise per pupil during the 2000s. My fellow Democrats, it is time to rewrite our old playbook of just proposing one new spending program after another and hoping that's going to improve student achievement and student outcomes. It hasn't brought progress in the past, and it won't for a simple reason. Many programs, no matter how well-intentioned they are, just don't work, as we've seen too often when the results are actually measured. So if we're going to make progress in education, we need to focus blueprint implementa bl the implementation of the blueprint on expanding programs that have been tested in the not just well-intentioned, not just sound good, but have been tested in the real world and shown to make a big difference in people's lives. Some concrete examples, I would expand tutoring to every struggling first and second grader in the entire state of Maryland, because that's been shown to move them up toward grade level early before their problems become serious. 
I would expand career academies because they've been in high poverty high schools, because they've been shown to increase long-term workforce earnings. And there are a number of Thank other you. examples, but tested and proven is essential, not just good intentions. Thank you. Uh, in this moment in time, this day and age, we are, uh, many Marylanders are going to school online. They're going to college online. We are going to our medical appointments online and we're working online. What as governor would you do to bridge the digital divide that exists in our state? Um, this question will go first to Mr. Jane. Yeah, thank you again so much for that question. So as I mentioned, uh, I guess a few questions ago, uh, the need to provide equal and full access to broadband, regardless of where in the state you live. I can't tell you how many times I speak with uh, residents in Western Maryland and Southern Maryland and parts of the Eastern Shore that do not have safe and full reliable broadband access. Uh, it is a big issue. It is an equity issue. It's an economic issue. It's an education issue. Uh, and so that's why I focused on that in, in a couple uh, answers before. Um, but really investing more in the Office of Rural Broadband in our state government, making sure we're installing 5G antennas, for example, on all utility poles, on all street lights and libraries as well, I think is another really practical and tangible way to get high speed internet and reliable internet. Uh, to all of these areas that typically do not have that access. And, you know, whether you talk about virtual learning or, uh, you know, running your business online or anything else that you need to do, whether it's COVID related or not, I think this is an issue that needs to be addressed in a really sustainable way. And that's how I would accomplish that. Thank you, Mr. King. You know, in many ways, the internet today is like electricity was in the 1940s in the New Deal era. You can't participate in the 21st century economy without the internet, just like you couldn't participate in the 20th century economy without electricity. So FDR responded with the Tennessee Valley Authority in the New Deal era. We now have to respond as a state and as a country to make sure everyone has access to broadband. The, the bipartisan infrastructure bill will help. The General Assembly's committed resources that will help. The next governor has to follow through on that. We also have to think about uh, the internet much more like a utility. One of the challenges we have is that even in places where the infrastructure is in place to have internet access, the relationship with the cable companies makes it impossible for people to get to internet access. It shouldn't be that because you're behind on your cable belt, you can't have internet. When the internet is necessary to participate in education, to get access to telehealth, to get to get access to government benefits. So we have to think very differently about our relationship uh, with the cable companies. We also have to make sure that we're supporting our teachers around uh, virtual learning. Even as we stay in school full time, we still know that the digital divide impacts kids' ability to do their homework, to get access to extra resources. So we need to provide professional development for teachers. We need to make sure every kid has a device uh, and that every kid has internet access. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you so much. And, and this, this is once again an issue that showed that COVID exposed the fact that there was not just an exacerbation of these disparities, but it was also just a, a massive exposure of the fact that we watch these disparities that exist in so many communities and children in many ways and their families are being punished by the poverty we are asking them to live under. Uh, you know, we absolutely do need to make sure that we are coming up with ways of, of, of having not just accessible, but affordable broadband access throughout the state. And that that is not just, that is not just a, an urban issue. It is not a rural issue. It is not a suburban issue. It is an issue that, that individuals, families, and children are facing all throughout this state. But it also does go back to what are the other questions we're asking about equity? When, when, this, when, when, when COVID first hit, you know, initially we were asking many times, oftentimes asking questions like, well, does this family have a device inside of their home for the child? Important question, but if that family has four children, what relevance is that question? So we have to be able to really connect with families to be able to understand the challenges that they are facing and how we can then address it. And I can tell you right now, the ability to address these issues, this has to deal with everything from school construction to 21st century schools. It's how are we addressing the plague of poverty that so many of our families continue to deal with and live with every day. Thank you, Mr. Perez. If you go to the United States Department of Commerce website, 
you will see a map of every state and it shows you the broadband infrastructure. Where are the broadband hotspots and where are the broadband dead spots? You can go anywhere in the country. And there's this myth that the broadband dead spots are simply in rural areas. The, look at Maryland and you will see broadband challenges across this state. And that's why what's happening in Washington with the passage of the infrastructure bill provides a remarkable set of opportunities here in Maryland for us to move forward. And in the Maryland General Assembly, I think it was HB 1372 last year, they pat the, the Democrats again, taking the lead, passed a law to make sure that we're increasing per pupil spending to account for these technology needs. So we have an opportunity here. And again, you know, on education, where we, we've had a governor who doesn't want this bill, you know, he, he didn't support this bill. And the technology needs are part and parcel of what we have to do. As your governor, I will make sure that broadband is like water, an essential public utility that's affordable and accessible to everyone. That's what we need to do. And we need to equip our schools and we need to equip our educators and we need to do so again. We need to make sure that we understand that we have to implement these things in a culturally competent way so that we're working with communities. Back to that earlier question about voice with teachers, communities, Thank everyone. You. That's how we succeed. Thank you. Mr. Baker? Yeah, th this effort has to be led by the state. Uh, I remember back in uh, 20, 2011 and 2012, uh, three jurisdictions in, in Maryland tried to deal with this issue. Uh, Howard County, Prince George's County when I was county executive, and Montgomery County. Um, and that was in 2012. And then COVID exposed that we weren't able to do that across the state. And so we knew we had a broadband issue uh, way back then. And for us not to have done something about it is, is shameful. Um, but now we have to move forward. There is an opportunity, as Mr. Perez said, uh, with uh, infrastructure dollars coming from the federal government. But there's also an opportunity for us to invest in these areas that we know uh, need help immediately. The, the one good thing that came out of COVID is we know where the hotspots are, where kids aren't being able to log on. So why don't we deal with those issues immediately? There's money right now the governor's office could use to make sure that doesn't happen. And then we move forward with the, some of the stuff that's coming out of the current commission to make sure that every uh, jurisdiction is, is, is up on uh, broadband. Um, but we have an opportunity, uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity to do capital projects, one time expenditure for dollars that we're getting, not only from the federal government, but dollars that we have in the state to address this problem that's way over uh, time that we fix. Thank you, uh, Mr. Barron. Thank you. Uh, I agree that we need to use the, bipart the money from the bipartisan infrastructure bill and other resources, which are there now, to expand, make sure every corner of the state has good broadband access, because that's critical infrastructure. And here's something important, however, in in, that I would raise, that we have to follow the evidence uh, in terms of what is in in terms of educational technologies and use of the infrastructure, use use of the internet and use of um, uh, and use of computers to improve education, we have to do what's tested and proven to work. So about ten years ago, the U.S. Department of Education rigorously tested 19 different educational technologies, software for teaching reading and math, and the rest. You know how many were actually effective at improving? Uh, reading and math achievement, one out of those 19. We need to test many different approaches. Now, here is one approach that, apart from that study, that was tested and shown very effective, an educational technology intervention that we should be expanding in Maryland because it could make an enormous difference. It's called assistments. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a technology where they, they give students laptops to bring home. Uh, they do, the students do their math homework on the laptop. Um, it's, uh, and then the teacher sees the next day which students had problems. Did a whole lot of students have problems with a particular problem so that the, the teacher can tailor the message to the student. That's been shown to, to increase uh, math achievement by Thank about you. a third of a Thank grade you. level. 
Mr. Gansler. Yes, thank you. Yes, we need to make a generation generational investment in broadband. I, I've gone out to Western Maryland every few weeks. I've been going out there for decades. Um, and the one thing you hear about in the wake of COVID is the rural broadband problem, the la what they call the last mile of getting broadband to each and every home. And this is a place where experience again matters. When I was attorney general, I actually worked with the telecom companies uh, on what they were calling cell phone insurance at the time. And we, we brought that down a two point four billion dollar fraud on the American people working with the telecommunications companies. Yes, we have infrastructure money available from the federal government, but we ought to make sure the telecommunications company pay their fair share here and make sure that they provide access because it, it is in fact a public utility and we ought to treat it as such. Um, you know, but but the bigger point is that we, we have to get away from online learning at, at, today. We need to put people back in classrooms, back in schools, um, but we will always live in a techn technological society, whether it's K through 12 or for our community colleges or HBCUs or four-year schools, we need to make sure everybody has access to high-speed uh, internet. Um, and and of, of course, that applies to jobs too. Um, and we COVID has really shown us the disparities, not just in the inner cities, but the rural areas like Western Maryland. If you're going to run for governor, you've got to be governor for the whole state of Maryland, including Western Maryland. Thank you. An economic analysis of the Blueprint Education Reforms found that the expansion of early childhood education programs would allow 10,000 Maryland women to return to the workforce. The Blueprint Reforms also raise the wages of educators, many of whom are women. What will you do to ensure that the education reform program also lifts up the women of Maryland? This question will go first to uh, Mr. King. Thanks. Well, th this is a critically important question. I, and, you know, just today I announced my running mate, Michelle Siri, who leads the uh, Women's Law Center of Maryland and has spent her life as an advocate for women's rights and gender equity. And so that's going to be central to everything we do in the King Siri administration. Child care is critical because a disproportionate share of the burden of unaffordable child care falls on women. It's driving women out of the workforce today all over Maryland. Uh, we need to make sure that we provide universal access to affordable child care, birth through five. That is achievable. Uh, the blueprint makes a down payment on pre-K. Uh, we need to, to build on that uh, with making sure that every child birth through five has quality care. Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, we are raising teacher pay, I think, more quickly even than was proposed in the blueprint. I've called for, in my blueprint for education, I, I've called for uh, moving to starting salaries of $60,000 by 2023. I think that's important because we need to make it possible for people to choose the teaching profession. We also know that the burden of student debt falls very heavily on teachers. We ought to do more to relieve student debt for teachers, particularly teachers who are going into the schools where we have the greatest need. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you. And uh, you know, the, the blueprint education reform only confirmed what I've known for my entire life and have seen with my own eyes. You know, growing up, I saw my single mom struggle to raise me and my siblings while juggling multiple jobs that didn't provide her benefits until I was 14 years old. And so that's why I've made access to childcare a priority throughout my entire career. You know, when I was CEO of one of the largest nonprofits in this country, we secured $50 million to, pro to provide 50,000 children under the age of three access to early childhood education through the Fund for Early Learning Program. And as governor, I will build an economy where women are able to fully participate in the workforce. We're going to fix our broken child care system, make it and, and make it more affordable, because right now child care can be more expensive than college tuition. We're going to ensure that every child in need has access to free pre-K. And, and we have to make sure that every Marylander has access to paid family and medical leave, which is why I am so excited to work with my good friend, Senator Antonio Hayes in this upcoming session to pass the Time to Care Act. So the North Star for, you know, I think about my running mate, uh, uh, Delegate Aruna Miller, former Delegate Aruna Miller, the North Star for the Moore Miller administration will be expanding work and wages and wealth. 
for every family in Maryland with a commitment to equity and a commitment to supporting women in Maryland in every sector is a core part of what we mean by equity. Thank you, Mr. Perez. As your former labor secretary, I'm still a labor geek and I uh, review the job numbers very carefully. And, and you know this, uh, the pandemic disproportionately uh, affected women. Um, women are caregivers disproportionately and women left the workforce in disproportionate numbers. And we know from, this is one of the, the beauties of this blueprint is that we have studied exhaustively what early childhood education will do Every business in Maryland has a vested interest in investing in early childhood education. So many kids, and there's a civil rights, there's a race dimension and an economic dimension. If you're poor, by the time you get to kindergarten, you're already way too far behind. If you're poor and you're a person of color, you're way, way behind. That's why we need to make these investments in quality early childhood education. And as your governor, I will do exactly that. As your labor secretary, I worked with Valerie Jarrett on the Lead on Leave campaign because we must implement paid leave. We're the only industrialized nation on the planet that doesn't have some form of paid leave. We can do this. People talk about the cost of doing it. We can't afford not to do that. And moving forward as your governor, I will do exactly that. I will also make sure that child care workers can organize because that's the way you lift wages by being able to organize child care workers. We will do this. We will accomplish this and unions will be a Thank big you. part of the solution here. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Now, one of the things that I'm pleased about in the current commission is that it takes this step to look at early childhood education and funds it. Uh, one of the things that we saw when I was a member of the Appropriations Committee uh, in Annapolis is that we started doing that. We actually put a bill in and put some dollars behind early childhood education. Um, but the pre-K education phased out. There was not enough commitment by the governor's office or legislature to put the dollars behind it. The current commission does it. That's a great first step. But the second step is to deal with child care. As uh, my wife and I have three had three children uh, when we were young and nobody, uh, no family members in this area. And so child care for three children was expensive, it was more than our mortgage. Um, so we're, we are, I'm committed in our administration. I know Nancy is committed, Nancy Navarro, my running mate, but she started out working in uh, a, a nonprofit child care that we provide the ability for everyone who has children to be able to have quality child care and be able to work because that's what's going to help increase our numbers. Um, it's something I worked on not only as a legislator, but also as county executive and made it a part of our administration when I was county executive. And as governor, I know that Nancy and I will uh, make this a key part of our administration. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Uh, thank you. So. Um, I support the blueprints call for expanded uh, pre-K, moving toward universal pre-K. Uh, one of the main functions that serves is a form of child care. Um, and so I think that's very important for women and for families generally. But also pre-K has, been, one of the reasons pre-K has so much potential is because certain forms of pre-K have been, have been found to be highly promising in improving child outcomes, educational outcomes, behavioral and other outcomes through elementary school. The key piece that I would bring as governor that is different from others is a focus as we expand pre-K on pre-K programs that have been tested and shown to work. We need to do that kind of rigorous testing to find out what works as we expand. There are certain types of pre-K like the Perry Preschool Program and Abbasidarian programs, certain curricula that have been found highly promising in small studies. As we expand pre-K, we need to test are they still effective? Are they very effective for children on a larger scale? The reason we need to do that kind of testing to find out what really works to improve child outcomes is because we don't wanna end up with, ten with, with what Tennessee did. They just jumped to statewide pre-K, $100 million a year. An evaluation was done and it was found that the students who participated in pre-K had no better outcomes, academic, behavioral or other, by third grade than the kids who didn't participate in pre-K. So to real, realize pre-K's full promise, we need to build in rigorous testing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gansler. 
Yeah, the, the wages uh, issue is incredibly important for teachers. This is should be the most revered position in our society. These are the people that we're entrusting our children to. We need to move away from standardized testing or obsession with standardized testing and allow our teachers to use their creativity and imagination to comport with the students' creativity and imagination. And we need to pay our teachers, men and women, frankly, more. My mother taught in the Montgomery County Public Schools for decades. And uh, that was one of the th things she used to talk about all the time. Like the, the fact that they're paying the teachers so little was outrageous to her and is outrageous to me. It will remain outrageous to me when I'm governor. We need to, uh, as I said when I announced, we need to make sure we have universal childcare and universal pre-K. That'll help us with uh, student homelessness issues, food insecurity issues, but most importantly, as, as my esteemed colleagues have said, it, it helps bridge that, that gap that exists by the time you show up in, in kindergarten that exists today. I started a nonprofit in Baltimore called the Charm City Youth Lacrosse, where we, we work with kids, we mentor kids. I mentored a child from uh, Am a young man at the time from Amazon Elementary School, and we need to make sure we help uh, mothers, single mothers, for example, in, in making sure we increase our mentorship opportunities. We need to have family paid leave. And you know, we, we all believe in the same things that are on this call at least. Um, but how do you know I can do it? Because I've done it before. When I left the state's attorney's office and attorney general's office, most of my supervisors were women. And we started a job share program. So we'll do that again when I'm done. Thank you. Mr. Jane. Yeah, thank you again so much for this question. So, you know, child care and early childhood education is super important. Um, and it really is critical to the success of all of our residents. Um, that's why I have been campaigning on universal pre-K making sure we're also expanding the child care credential programs to incentivize those child care providers, for example, many of whom are also women-owned business owners who comply with those regulations. We also need to really look at the bigger picture and reduce the cost of living overall, increase wages, and provide everyone more disposable income. And that's really the best way to bring equity to all Marylanders, including women, including women of color, including trans women, and all those who are not getting the resources that they need and deserve. And that's why one of my signature programs on the campaign is called the Maryland Now Plan, which in addition to my education policy platform, which is at janeforgovernor.com, is fully paid for and created in partnership with residents from every county in this state, and it will eliminate the state income tax for 95% of Marylanders, guarantee free public transit, and create the nation's very first guaranteed jobs program. But again, looking at these issues in a really sincere and comprehensive way and giving more residents a genuine seat at the table from day one and not just once the election is over. Thank you. Um, turning to the COVID-19 pandemic, as governor, are you willing to use your power as the executive of the state to ensure the safety of children, including mask mandates, virtual learning, vaccine passports, Please explain what efforts you would undertake and your reasoning. Uh, we're going to start on this one with Mr. Moore. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think we have seen now more, more than, than ever uh, that we are in a time where we need decisive action and leadership and, and proven executive leadership. You know, and as a leader, I am data driven and heart led. And the data is very, very clear keeping our students safely in the classroom is absolutely critical to their well-being, their academic growth, better for their families. Uh, and it also has to be a priority moving forward because we have to remember that our schools are also the largest food provider, the largest child care provider, uh, the largest mental health provider that we have. And so it's why I recently called on Governor Hogan to take immediate action to increase access to testing because that has to be there in order for us to accomplish that to secure an adequate supply of PPE and to drive up vaccination rates across our state. You know, our, our pathway out of this pandemic is clear and it's by following the science and the advice of experts. And that also means keeping school masking requirements in place and considering adding the COVID vaccine to the school vaccine schedule once it receives full approval. And finally, uh, we must prioritize longer term solutions like new and modern school facilities so that we have the proper ventilation systems to ensure that our children and our educators are safe now and in the future. Thank you. Mr. Moore, or Mr. Perez, I'll get it together. Mr. Perez. <laughs> that was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
this, I mean, safety is job one. I think we all agree on that. And uh, science is how we get to safety. And I mean, again, I, I, I recall recently, I mentioned earlier when the, the governor criticized Prince George's County for going virtual and, and yet the data they were, would have relied on wasn't available because the system wasn't working, it was down. Um, and then you go criticize them, that's not right. So in my administration, we're gonna make sure we do everything possible to keep people safe. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I wanna make sure we provide hazard pay to teachers and we can do this. We can do this without breaking the bank um, and we can provide ha hazard pay to other educators. Uh, the county executive in Howard County, and I applaud him, Calvin Ball is doing this already. And, and the reason I bring this up is because I wanna send a message to folks who are in these front lines across the state that you know, we know this is challenging. We know this has been difficult. You know, we can do this virtually tonight and I'll be safe, but you know, there's so many jobs where you just can't do that. And so I really think that we should be doing, and I hope in this Maryland General Assembly that we pass legislation that will expand hazard pay for folks because that's really important moving forward. And I, I put out a very, very specific statement about other things that the governor should do. And I'm, I'm glad that he declared that state of emergency because we, we do need to have these tools in place. But again, much more can be done. Thank and you. that's what I will do. Uh, Mr. Baker? No, no I, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Perez, especially when he's talking about uh, Prince George's County uh, Superintendent. Not only did she not have the dashboard information that she needed, uh, she didn't have access to rapid testing. And so delaying, she didn't close down the school, she <laughs> delayed it. So one that she would have access to rapid testing. Uh, we need to make sure that every jurisdiction has access right now to rapid testing, not only for our teachers, but for our students and mm -hmm. for those who are working in our facilities. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this should be led by the state. There is a reason that every county and the state has a director of Homeland Security and a director for um, our health office is they should be leading this effort. Emergencies like what we're in, uh, when I was county executive, we had our Homeland Security person leading the efforts along with our health department. They should be coordinating at the state level and as governor, I would do this, coordinating with every Homeland Security person throughout our 24 jurisdictions and our health officers who are jointly uh, appointed by the governor and the executives and the mayor um, in these jurisdictions so that we make sure it's a coordinated effort so we don't have these mismatches of uh, what's going on in the jurisdictions. And we also find that the counties and the school systems are pooling their resources um, to provide more money, provide uh, money to get uh, uh, testing. We need to make sure the state is actually stepping in and helping. Thank you. Mr. Barron. Thank you. The single most important thing that we can do and that the governor should take the lead on is to get vaccination rates up across the state. Vaccines are extremely effective, including boosters, at preventing serious illness and death. They're over 90 percent effective. Currently, fewer than 50 percent of children who are eligible for the vaccine are currently fully vaccinated. Uh, we need to change that. So I was the first candidate. I may be the only candidate still to call for uh, uh, vaccine requirements for all teachers staff, and staff in the state, just like um, uh, uh, Oregon and Washington have done. Um, I have called for vaccine requirements for all students age 16 and over. Um, I've called for and would provide the resources to get clinics, vaccine clinics, into every school in the state. When I was in school, we all lined up and got polio vaccines. We've been requiring vaccines for students, measles, polio, rubella, and so on for decades. This is no different, and this is worse. This is a public health emergency. We should be pulling out every stop. The governor should be doing every, pulling every lever at his or her disposal to make sure we get vaccination rates up. I also agree with other things, improving ventilation in schools, providing rapid testing. State should be providing the resources there. But the thing that's really going to make the difference and get us out of this damn pandemic is the vaccines. Thank you. Mr. Gansler? Yeah, COVID is, in fact, a crisis situation. And we need somebody as governor who's actually led. I've been in government for 23 years working on state, local, and federal issues. Getting things done with a proven record 
of accomplishment and through and doing so with democratic values. Now, what that means is, is following the science in this particular case. And that means making sure we do what is in the best interest of our students and our teachers and our staff in our schools. And, and it's changed. I mean, we're look, we're almost in two years now of this COVID situation. At the beginning, we needed to be virtual. We didn't have a vaccination, but now we do. And so we, it, it's unbelievable to me that we're even talking about this, that we don't have vaccination and booster mandates. Of course, we need to have those. We need to stop letting the few outliers ruin the learning experience for everyone else. And we, can't, we cannot send a, 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 our children back to a completely virtual atmosphere. Should there be a virtual option for some students who are in immunocompromised situations and other uh, situations like that? Yes. We need to make sure the vaccinations are eligible at school settings and community centers and and they really are by now and make sure everybody has a booster as well. So every teacher eligible student, volunteer, parent must be vaccinated and boosted. Um, and, and, you know, I echo Wes's call for, for safer, healthier school buildings. I mean, look at Delaney High School in Timonium. You can't, there's discolored water coming out, rust, mold infested buildings. And that's no way to, to be safe in our schools either. Thank you, Mr. Jane. Thank you. Um, safety really is priority one. And that's why in the very first question you asked tonight, I was clear in my approach to mandating vaccines and masks for all of our residents. You know, I've created mobile campaign offices in each and every county in our state. And so I'm consistently in a different county every day of the week. And when I bring up this notion of mandating vaccines or masks, I sometimes get pushed back from those who are concerned about their individual freedoms being taken away. So let me be really clear on this. When personal choices and freedoms impact public safety, I believe the government and the governor need to impose mandates. It's also not a new thing. We already mandate vaccines for anyone who attends a public school, and we already have systems in place that are like a proof of the vaccines. If you go to a bar, for example, and wanna buy a drink, or if you have a baby face like I do, you are required to provide your license and your ID to prove your age. So we really need to be practical on these issues and focus on the science. It is as simple as that. We've been doing this now for two years at least. Uh, that's the only way we can really keep our schools and our businesses open and e each and every one of our residents safe. Thank you. Uh, Mr. King. You know, I think you've heard a lot of agreement on, on where the governor needs to be. We need access to testing. We need a statewide mass mandate that shouldn't be uh, left to every county to decide. We should have a statewide mass mandate. We should be investing in the state supplying masks for school staff and kids at school, high quality masks to help people stay safe. We should require the vaccine for state employees, for county employees, for school district employees. Uh, we should move towards a vaccine requirement for students as it is approved for full use. And we should be doing more to make sure that we get folks vaccinated and get folks the booster. As I mentioned earlier, we're seeing this emerging racial gap in booster access. That is a real concern. Uh, we've got to make sure that folks can get the booster. But I think one of the things we should step back and think about is what are the lessons of this public health crisis? It is a problem that there are Marylanders who don't have health care. We have to make sure every Marylander has health care. We need to make sure that folks, regardless of immigration status, have health care. We can deliver on that. And we need to make sure that we have enough nurses in our schools so that they can help their schools manage student health issues. Uh, we need to make sure that every worker in Maryland has access to paid sick leave so that we can protect folks uh, when they are sick. Um, there's more to do here on our broader public health system because unfortunately, we will have crisis like, crises like this in the future. Thank you. Uh, switching gears, I wanna ask everyone whether or not that you whether or not you believe that non-public schools should be barred from receiving public funding if they do not have non-discrimination policies in place this question will go first to mr perez you you uh could you repeat the question because uh a third of it dropped out so i couldn't hear i'm it. so sorry um, the question is, do you believe that non-public schools should be barred from public funding if they do not have non-discrimination policies in place? Should they be barred from public funding? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we, we want to make sure that we don't discriminate. Uh, and we want to make sure we don't discriminate in how we are 
um, addressing our funding needs. You know, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which I used to enforce, says if you receive federal financial assistance, you can't discriminate on the basis of race, color, or national origin. And so um, I think that is, uh, you know, I think that's a similar question to what you're asking uh, in, in this setting. And so if you are discriminating, then you should forfeit the right to be able to participate in, um, in those programs. And so, uh, you know, that's a basic tenet of our uh, civil rights laws. And, um, you know, those laws are laws that I enforced for some time. Now, um, you know, I, I think that um, there's a lot, you know, you know, we're talking about education tonight. And, you know, I, I want to underscore something that I've said a number of times, which is, uh, we are fully committed to implementing this blueprint. And I think it bears repeating because um, while there seems to be agreement on this panel, um, there's not agreement across this state. And I think if people are watching this, uh, they are going to be very, very, they're going to wonder because this is the most important issue I think that we're taking up is how we educate our kids and how we produce our world-class workforce. And make no mistake about it, that's where Tom Perez is, implementing the blueprint. Thank you. Mr. Baker? Um, yeah, I think you'll, you'll find broad agreement on the, uh, this question is that, no, you should not receive federal funds if you are federal state funds, um, if you're um, discriminating, whether it's for education or whether it's contracts. As a legislator in, um, in Annapolis, uh, whether I was on the Appropriations Committee, or judiciary where I served for four years. Uh, that was my belief in our policies that we implemented. And as county executive, um, you're taking public dollars, you commit to the philosophy uh, that we have as a, as a society that everyone is treated uh, equally. So if you're discriminating, uh, you should not get you know, public dollars. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Thank you. I also agree that uh, schools that are receiving funds should have to have non-discrimination policies in place. So uh, I agree broadly on that. I want to take a few minutes to, to um, a few minutes, <laughs> a few seconds, sorry, uh, to uh, speak to something uh, uh, broader. I mentioned earlier that in education, Maryland is stuck, that our achievement levels, despite a significant increase in education spending during the 2000s, have been flat for 20 years. Um, more than that, we are stuck in other areas as well. We've had stagnant, low and moderate income Marylanders have had stagnant wages, basically the bottom 40% of Marylanders since the 1980s, if you can believe it. Our poverty rate today is 9%. That's the same thing it was, same rate it was in 1995. So in education and other areas of social policy, we are just not making progress in sol solving these long-term problems. My fellow Democrats, we really need to rewrite the playbook of just proposing one new unproven program after the other. That hasn't worked. It hasn't brought progress. We need to focus instead on solutions like the ones I've described, tutoring in the early grades and others that have been tested in the real world and shown to make a big difference in people's lives. If it's just one unproven plan after the next, it's spinning wheels and we're gonna be here in another 20 years talking about the same thing, nothing will have changed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gansler on discrimination policies. Yes, 100%. If you discriminate, you don't get state money, you don't get federal money, as a matter of fact. Um, I started the first civil rights department in Maryland's history when I was attorney general. We went after uh, companies and anybody who discriminates. And we tried to promote diversity through our civil rights department. Carl Snowden was my first head of the Civil Rights Department, we made enormous strides through the Attorney General's office and then uh, General Frosch expanded upon that uh, during his tenure. Um, you know, when I was Attorney General, I also uh, came up with a manual uh, that I actually disseminated to every Attorney General of the United States about what they could and could not do in terms of diversity and bringing in, in both in terms of teachers, students, um, there had been a chilling effect in, in the wake of some of the Supreme Court cases. And, and what we, we tried to do is give a blueprint as to how you could actually enhance diversity in our higher education schools, which was the Attorney General had um, 
jurisdiction over. We represented those schools. You know, the last thing I'd say in this issue, and it, it struck me when I was a child, I, I, I remember when I was at Chevy Chase Elementary, and I'm old, and I'm one of the few actually on this panel that grew up in Maryland. And I remember when I was at Chevy Chase Elementary, and busting was the issue. And the parents were the ones that were protesting against busting, bringing in kids from Rosemary Hills um, at the time. Obviously, now they, they're, they're, they're both schools are integrated. And I just have to say, we, I think everybody on this panel agrees, diversity is our strength. And we shouldn't discriminate against anybody. We should welcome and embrace diversity. Thank you. Mr. Jane. Yeah, I mean, we obviously need to require that any entity that receives public dollars also follow certain guidelines, like being transparent with how those funds are used, guaranteeing collective bargaining rights for employees, being held accountable, and not discriminate in any sense of the word. I also believe public dollars should be used for public schools and improving them for every student, regardless of their zip code. Beyond that, though, we must look at the systemic racism that plagues every policy in every part of our society. Uh, that's why, and you know, that's some of the work that I've been fighting for in the work I do at the National Kidney Foundation, in the work I previously did in the Obama White House, at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, and also at the US Department of Health and Human Services. That's also why I have a comprehensive and detailed policy platform, over 150 detailed policies on my website that I've shared since January of 2021, all in full partnership with people from every age, every color, every background, and every county in our state. That's really how we start to focus on not just short-term solutions, but long-term solutions for all these issues that are plagued by discrimination, by the systemic racism that we're seeing, and just by the lack of attention that a lot of times our elected officials give us. Thank you. Mr. King? Yes, and there's no question if a school is discriminating, they should not receive state or federal funds. But I'd go a step further and say, I don't think public dollars in Maryland should be going to private schools. The boost program is essentially a way to achieve a voucher program. And that's how Governor Hogan would talk about it. Uh, it should be eliminated. Public dollars should go to public schools to address the, the needs of our public school students. I, I respect that maybe people who choose private schools for their families, but, the, but state funds should be going to pu public education. Uh, I was a kid whose life was saved by public schools when both my parents passed away when I was little, my mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. That's why I became a teacher, because of a deep understanding of the role schools can play in kids' lives. It's why I became a principal. It's why I led schools at the local level and state level. It's why I was honored to serve as United States Secretary of Education for President Obama, because of a deep appreciation of the critical role public education plays, not just in the health of our economy, but ultimately in the health of our democracy.
Testing one, two, three. Okay. Gotcha. okay. We're, we're Danielle, we're going to go to you. We're about to start in about a, a few seconds. Sure. All right, Danielle, I'm going to give you a five second count. After the okay. five seconds, you can go ahead and start talking. Okay, thanks. All right, five, four, three, two, one, you can go. Thank you. Uh, we are back. And uh, Mr. Moore, it's your uh, answer on the issue of discrimination policies um, in non-public schools. Uh, thank you. And I feel so passionately about this that I'll say it again. Uh, you know, my, my commitment is for every Maryland student to have access to a world-class public education. And that is free from fear or free from any form of discrimination. And, and, and the reason that we have to be aggressive on this is because I know how pervasive discrimination actually is. You know, we, we oftentimes will hear people say that we are products of our environments. Um, but I remember a couple of decades ago, uh, my perspective got enhanced when I heard someone say, but I believe we're products of our expectations. Because the expectations that we have are oftentimes rooted in bias and discrimination. The expectations that people have of themselves don't come from nowhere. They come from the expectations that other people have of them. So my administration will not tolerate discrimination in any form. I will always take immediate action to dismantle all forms of discrimination and systemic racism and ensure that our children are positioned for success in every single aspect of their life and especially within education. And so I absolutely believe that any school receiving state funding should be required to live up to the same standards as Maryland's public schools, providing equal access for all and preparing our young people for post-secondary and career success, period. Thank you. Okay, everyone has done a good job hewing to the clock so far. We are now on to some submitted questions and this is a lightning round. You'll have one minute to answer each of these questions. And these are from your voters. So I would suggest hitting your high points first. Um, this, we're going to start back from the top on this. So uh, we'll start with Mr. Baker. What is your position on adding financial literacy to the school curriculum? And how would you structure that curriculum to adapt it to elementary, middle, and high school? Uh, I'm in favor of it. In fact, one of the things that we did when I was county executive was to do just that. We started with the middle school, though, um, and we moved it up to our high schools. Uh, that way that we have our young people coming out of, and it's something I wish I had done uh, when I was in high school or, as, or in middle school. So I, as governor, would work with our um, state school board and our superintendent to make sure that we're um, helping local jurisdictions to do the same thing. I think it's a great program, and uh, it's something that I was supportive of as, as county executive, and I saw the benefits of it, in, especially in some of our high-need schools. So um, I'm in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Barron. <clears throat> yes, I'm in favor of it too. Um, I think uh, financial literacy education is very important, but I just wanna, coming back to my main theme, there are a lot of things that sound well-intentioned but don't actually work. So we need to test different forms, different curricula, different training to see what actually works to improve <laughs> student savings and so on not just rely on good intentions and a curriculum that sounds plausible. 
There's one other thing we can do on uh, sort of encouraging savings, uh, savings for college for students. There is a tested and proven program called learning accounts that provide students with, uh, in, starting in ninth grade, these are low income students um, with uh, a certain amount of money, $5,000 if they, if they graduate 10th grade, 11th grade, that can only be used it goes, if they go to college. So at that point, if they graduate, they can use it for college. It's been shown to increase the high school and college graduation rate uh, by about seven percentage points. That's a really big effect. That's the kind of uh, uh, savings Thank uh, intervention that could be very effective. Mr. Gansler. Yes, I, I, I not only favor financial literacy in schools, I actually promoted it. Uh, as I mentioned, when I was president of all the attorneys general of the United States, um, we had the national mortgage, for, for, national mortgage foreclosure crisis. We saw the result of what happens when people don't have financial literacy. We, uh, we were able to take on the big banks. We got about $38 billion throughout the United States, almost $2 billion here in, in Maryland to make sure we kept people from being foreclosed upon and evicted as a result of not having financial literacy uh, in their educational uh, program. We need to make sure it's available in community colleges as well, as well as our four-year institutions. The, the more immediate uh, impact of not having it is student loan debt, which is saddling uh, students throughout the country right now. And we need to make sure that students, before they enter into uh, a contract to have debt, to go to school, they understand what it is they're, they're doing, what they're contracting for, and their obligations that will ensue from that contract. Thank you. Mr. Jane? Yeah, I've been advocating for financial literacy to be added to the curriculum in middle and high schools. Um, I would also work with the school board members, including our student members of the board, in terms of implementation and actual execution. Uh, but we also have to ensure that we're improving the financial situations of every Marylander so they not only understand how to better manage their dollars better and more efficiently, but also have more to manage and invest and save in the first place. And that's really where I tie it into my Maryland Now plan and about 150 other policies that really reduce the cost of living and improve and increase disposable income for every Marylander uh, before, during, and after their education. Thank you. Mr. King? We should definitely incorporate financial literacy into the K-12 curriculum. Um, and we have to make sure that every student graduates with a clear plan for what they're gonna do after high school. We can tackle that by following through on the commitment and the blueprint to high quality career and technical education available to every student. Advanced placement or international baccalaureate or dual enrollment opportunities, take college classes while in high school available for every student statewide. And then we've got to make sure that college is affordable. Uh, we have too many loopholes to our promise of free community college in Maryland. We should eliminate those and make sure that community college is genuinely free for all Marylanders. And we should make sure that undocumented students are able to access state aid in the same way as any other student, so that they can pursue higher education. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Strong financial literacy is going to be key to economic success and any person's ability to build long-term wealth. And, and, and for generations, uh, communities of color have been prevented from building wealth for generations, and it's past time that we take steps to address that. You know, not only do I want our young people to succeed in the workplace, I want them positioned to start their own Maryland-based businesses. That, that financial literacy is important because it's not just about how to be an employee, it's about how to be an employer. You know, I, I operated a successful small business here in Maryland, but the reality is I didn't learn the basic understandings of finance until college and grad school. It wasn't something that we learned in my family. And, and that wasn't to any fault. But I believe we must start teaching our students early about the implications of debt and various affordable pathways to good paying careers and entrepreneurship. And it's one of the reasons why the service year option that I've proposed for high school graduates will include a robust financial literacy curriculum that will position our young people for long-term success in the workplace and as business owners. Thank you. Mr. Perez? I also agree with uh, having financial literacy in place in, in the schools. I would also go a step further though, because I really think that uh, what we need to do more of is give students experiential learning opportunities. I was U.S. Labor Secretary uh, when Freddie Gray took place. In the aftermath, uh, President Obama asked me to lead the administration's response. 
And one of the things we did in Baltimore City was work with the schools to establish what we what are called uh, PTEC programs. These are programs where student high school kids could have a mentor. There would be a corporation that would partner with them, give them experiential learning opportunities. Then when you graduate, you can also go and get free community college. And so you get to see the world. I not only want people to be financially literate at a young age, I want them to see an entire universe of possibilities. We have large Rolodex or contacts folders. So many young kids don't. And I would, as your governor, make sure we expand those opportunities for our youngsters to see the world and experience that. Thank you. Moving on to a different form of literacy. How can Maryland be stronger at tackling early literacy for students and making sure that they're reading and writing at grade level? This question goes first to Mr. Barron. Thank you. One of the most effective things that we can do and one of the top priorities of my administration for early literacy would be to provide high quality tutoring to every struggling first and second grader in the entire state of Maryland. Um, it's been shown to be extremely effective, that kind of early intervention at moving them up toward grade level early in elementary school before their problems become serious in later grades. We need to get every child, it's a way of getting almost every child on grade level reading by third grade. It's one of the most effective things we can do. Here's how we would do it. We would engage the community, including retirees and recent college graduates to become tutors for a modest stipend for a pub, as a public service. Essentially, this would be a statewide effort, a community-wide effort to make sure that every child in Maryland starts their educational journey with success and is able to read and do basic math by third grade. Thank you. Mr. Gansler? Yeah, I think that the, we talked about it a little bit tonight, which is universal childcare and, and universal pre-K. And, and so right now what happens is when they get, when kids get to kindergarten, they're, they're already too far behind kids that are coming from homes that where they're not getting the proper tools, they're not getting the proper instruction, not getting frankly the right, the, a, a mentor or somebody uh, who tells them the difference between right from wrong. I read to my kids every single night um, and, and they are readers, avid readers today, I think in large measure because of that. And I think when, when we expose children to uh, those kind of opportunities and actually peer groups where they're reading, uh, that's gonna be critical. If you go, go to Baltimore City right now, if you're, if you're lucky enough to survive to graduate, and if you're lucky enough to graduate, uh, more, ki more children can't do an eighth grade reading level or eighth grade math level than can. And so we need to really look at our education system and, and provide every student in Maryland with a gold class uh, education background. Thank you. Mr. Jane. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think the best way to really improve early literacy is to provide early childhood education and universal pre-K, as I discussed earlier, uh, and making sure that the budget reflects this, not just for those in wealthy areas, but for every child, regardless of their zip code. It also means investing in our public libraries and giving them the resources they need to keep these options available for everyone, again, regardless of zip code, which I think often uh, is the issue when it comes to implementing a lot of these policies and budget. Thank you. Mr. King? You know, it starts very early. Paid family leave will help get a better foundation for kids when their parents are able to be home in those critical early weeks. Uh, making sure we have nurse family visitation programs where nurses visit the parents of, uh, um, of newborns over the first few months of their life to help support them as they adjust to being new parents. Um, birth through five universal high quality child care and early childhood education, all of that will lay the, the right foundation. Then we have to focus on the early years literacy challenge. And too often we aren't using the best research on how to support early readers. Uh, we know that part of helping young students to become strong readers is to make sure their, their instruction includes decoding skills. We have many dyslexic students who aren't getting the support they need because they aren't getting those decoding schools skills early on. We've got to make sure we've got the right training and supports and curriculum in place for early literacy. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Thank you so much. And, and 
this is an issue that uh, I've spent much of my uh, much of my career on because you know I, I know how challenging it is. I, I was one of the kids who was not reading at grade level uh, by third grade, and and I know that they're really and all the data again as a leader, I'm data driven and heart led, and I know the three leading reasons why students are not reading at grade level, generally by third grade, is, is one is chronic absence. So students who are just missing much of the school year. Uh, the second is students who are entering school unprepared. Uh, and the third, and, and, and the, thir the third reason is, as we're thinking about the educational frameworks for our kids, making sure we have those supports in place from a very early thing, and that includes summer learning. And so we must actually address the data and be able to address all of those things. And that includes things like strengthening early education programs by developing a center uh, and a system for early childhood education centers, having affordable, accessible, and subsidies to those families as we serve in need, and being able to make sure we're focusing on English and math early for students that will help them to expand access to care. Thank you. Mr. Perez? I mean, when we've all talked about early childhood education, and that's what I love about this blueprint. Paying attention to that is so, so important to our success because we can identify uh, kids who may have uh, special needs at an earlier age. Another thing we need to do is reduce our class sizes. It's really hard to engage in these conversations and really do the identification when you're a teacher uh, who is handling a class of 30, 35 kids. You just can't give the individual attention that they deserve. Another thing we need to do is work to expand the number of classes for adult English learners. I led a task force in Montgomery County on adult learners, and we dramatically increased our investments uh, so that parents can learn those English language skills that not only enable them to read to their children, but also enable them to move up the economic ladder of success. So that's what I love about the blueprint. It is an integrated approach. And when we do all of these things, I think we can really expand Thank opportunity you. for kids. Thank you. Mr. Baker? No, it's also the thing that I love about the blueprint. Um, what it does, and, I'm, and my good friend John Barron would like this, is that it took the things that we looked at over the last 20 years that we know will work, like reading recovery like making sure that we're looking at our children who are in third and sixth grade. I know for a fact it works because our middle child uh, was part of reading recovery, but it wasn't in every school everywhere across the state. And so what the blueprint okay. allows us to do is to offer these things that we know are working everywhere across the state with mentors and uh, master teachers that are gonna help. And so I think the way that we move it up and this will help everybody is focusing on those things that we know will work that have worked in places in our public schools around the state, but we don't offer everywhere. And then we put the resources in there that's continuing. And so as governor, I'm gonna make sure that we provide the resources that we continue this process so that those who are at third grade and sixth grade level can also graduate on time. Thank you. All right, uh, we wanna keep everybody with us before they head off to bed. So we're gonna ask one more uh, one minute answer question. Um, this one will go first to Mr. Gansler. Um, what is your plan for high school graduates who don't know exactly what they want to do when it comes to career or education? Yeah, and when I was young, we used to have vocational schools and people said, you can't have vocational schools because you're pigeonholing uh, children of underserved communities and, and minorities at an early age. And I, and I agree with that. But we do need to have vocational training accessible, technical training accessible uh, to students that, that simply want to, don't want to go to college and don't want to, uh, you know, they, they want to have become an HVAC person, they want to become a plumber, they want to make six digit figures uh, doing that. And they need vocational training. We also need to make sure we have vocational training for our returning citizens, people are, that are in jail and coming back and, and make sure they can get a, a degree in culinary arts or auto mechanics or what have you uh, and, and provide incentives for companies to hire those, those folks. And, and we need to make sure we uh, beef up and enhance our community colleges because so many people now come out of our high schools and wanna to go to community colleges. And for example, we're gonna have a two year requirement for police officers to get a, a degree, associate's degree in public safety. Thank you. Mr. Jane? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, investing in vocational schools, trade schools, uh, I think are super important. Also making community colleges more affordable and accessible, I think are great practical next steps. Uh, but then also making sure we have guaranteed jobs. Um, so that's one part of my Maryland Now plan 
uh, is providing a guaranteed job to anyone who's not able to find work or someone who's maybe not sure of what they want to do next, giving them practical hands-on skills that will benefit our state and also help them build their resume. For example, if you're a student or a young person wanting to figure out what to do next uh, and then giving you a good living wage and then making sure we're partnering with the private sector and nonprofit sectors as well as we're building out these programs. And again, full details can be found at janeforgovernor.com so you can hold me accountable and see exactly more of what my plans are all about. Thank you, Mr. King. You know, one of the challenges we have is that many of our school's counselors are overwhelmed in our high schools, you know. Um, my daughters have been at the Montgomery County Public Schools. I see this firsthand all the time, how large the caseloads are for school counselors. I'm glad that the blueprint will direct resources that will help us add more school counselors. They, they are the folks who can help support students as they think through their post-secondary plans, whether that's career or college. We need those high quality career and technical education programs that the blueprint invests in. Uh, we have to make sure that there are good jobs, that they're tied to those good green jobs that will be created by our shift to renewable energy, that they're preparing young people to transition into high tech jobs. We have to make sure that career and tech ed isn't where you go for jobs that are uh, low skill, but actually high skill, high wage jobs. Uh, and then we've got to make sure that we invest in our public higher education system, especially our HBCUs, which play a vital role as an engine of social mobility. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited about our ability to, to transform this process in this moment. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I'm the only candidate, you know, running who has an associate's degree. And, uh, you know, sometimes people say, you know, you are the first Black Rhodes Scholar in the history of Johns Hopkins, and the ring that you wear is from your junior college. And it's true, and I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of the fact that we have to present options to all of our students. And that means being able to invest in things like apprenticeship programs and trade programs, pathways to good, strong, solid jobs, and making sure we're starting early so that if a student chooses to go on to a four-year pathway, that's fine. But if a student is not sure that that's what they wanna do, or they have a different idea for their future, that we wanna support that as well. We are also going to be the first state in this country to provide a universal, uh, provide a service year option. And to be able to provide the option for all students to be able to have a sense of connection to the state, make service sticky, and at the same time, being able to use that paid year as a way of helping them to think about what they want to do next with their own lives. Thank you. Mr. Perez. I mentioned before that I'm a big fan of experiential learning, giving students an opportunity to see the world and see what people do. Uh, when I was U.S. Labor Secretary, I brought in kids from my uh, student. My, we, I'm a proud public school parent, and I wouldn't bring in my daughters and my son's friends. I would make sure I was bringing in to the Labor Department people who don't have that opportunity. We need to expand those experiential learning opportunities. So when someone finishes high school, he or she can have a much more uh, broad frame of reference from which to choose what to do. We need to expand and, and, and make sure we give career and technical education the stature it deserves. We have undervalued it. And we do that at our peril. What uh, apprenticeship is the other college, except without the debt. And we must continue to redouble our efforts. And that's what I love about the blueprint. It's focus on career and technical education. When we do this, that's how we can help those students Thank have you. those options. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Thank you. I, I think the, the way we have to look at this is you can't wait to the senior year of a, a student to decide what options mm -hmm. are going to happen. One of the things that we tried to do, and, and it was successful in Prince George's County, was one to start in middle school. Start looking at the different career options that our students can take. Um, we also expanded our summer program. And I'd want to do this as governor, where we actually put students not just into a job that gave them a check, but exposed them to different careers uh, out there that they could go into. And so by the time they get to high school, they start thinking about the various careers. The other thing is our schools, having variety in the schools that uh, our high schools that we offer. I know for me and, and my wife, uh, you know, our children went to a, a visual and performing arts high school, which started them down their career path. Two are artists, uh, one's a lawyer. Um, but having these choices where we expose our children to different career options for them is the best way to get them thinking and excited about the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barron. 
Yes, more than half of students end up not completing a college degree. We need a path forward for all students, whether they go on to college or not, to be able to get the education and the skills that they need to succeed in the workforce. Now, in the area of career and technical education and job training, the details really matter. What the, which programs the government chooses to invest in makes a difference. Many programs don't work, but some really do. We should expand them. Here's one that I would expand. I would launch in my first 100 days as governor a statewide partnership with businesses across Maryland to provide proven effective job training programs to every young adult in the state. Um, if it's done right, job training is very effective. It's been shown to increase earnings as much as 40%. But the key is to focus that training on fast growing industries like IT and healthcare. And second, to work very closely with local employers who provide paid internships to the trainees. Under my plan, the state will pay for the training, the businesses pay for the internships, the economy gets skilled workers, everyone benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for answering questions this evening. We really appreciate it. And now we will move to some brief closing remarks from each candidate. This is again, a one minute timer. So take a big breath. Uh, Mr. Jane, you will be up first. All right. Well, thank you all so much for this opportunity. For everyone listening, my name is Ashwani Jane. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a 32 year old cancer survivor who's a son of immigrants, a product of Maryland public schools. I've worked in the public, private and nonprofit sectors. And I served in the Obama White House and two federal agencies. I am running for governor to make our politics more inclusive and accessible. And this idea of inclusion started when I was 13 and diagnosed with cancer. During that time, I saw a world in which I would not get to leave the four walls of that hospital room. I found that many were making decisions for me and not with me. So I felt depressed, hopeless, and helpless. And that's why I believe in making decisions with people and not for them. That's why I have mobile offices in every county, why all my events are free, and why my entire campaign is crowdsourced, where you, volunteers, residents of Maryland, make policies and strategies. You can learn more at janeforgovernor.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. King, your closing remarks. Thanks for the discussion tonight. I'm so glad we were all able to focus on education tonight because it is so central to the future of our economy and our democracy. For me, my whole reason for getting into public service was the difference that schools made in my life when I was a kid. Both my parents were educators, but they both passed away when I was little. My mom when I was eight and my dad when I was 12. And as I mentioned earlier, it was schools that saved my life. It was great public school teachers who gave me a sense of hope and purpose and possibility and made school a place that was safe and compelling and engaging. And I've worked my whole career as a teacher, as a principal, as secretary of education for President Obama to try to deliver that for all kids. Um, we need to make sure in Maryland that all of our public institutions are working to make that positive difference in people's lives. Our work on education, on economic development, on the environment, all has to be driven by the idea that government can be a powerful force for good in people's lives. Thank you. Mr. Moore, you have one minute. Thank you. Uh, I'm a third generation Marylander. I was born here. I came of age here. My wife and I were raising our kids here. And I recently spoke with my aunt, who is an educator in Prince George's County. And after 37 years, she said this is the first time that she's actually considering making this year her last because of the enormous stress and pressure that this pandemic has put on her. And I know she's not alone. This is an incredibly difficult time for parents and educators, for students and administrators. And right now we need a leader to acknowledge these challenges, to bring these groups together and to take action. And that's how I've always led. And that's how I will lead us as governor. The next governor is responsible for making the blueprint work or not. And as governor, I'm not only committed to fully funding it, but working with parents and educators to make sure it's properly implemented. We will leave no one behind in this state. And I ask you for your support in this journey. Thank you. Mr. Perez, your final thoughts? Good evening and thank you for this incredibly important forum on educational opportunity. And my parents taught me that education was a great equalizer. My father worked himself to an early grave, making sure he provided for his five children. And I'm running for governor because I wanna make sure that zip code never determines destiny, that every student, every child from cradle through career 
can have access to those equal educational opportunities. I am so appreciative of the educators across this state. Thank you for what you do. You don't get enough respect. As your governor, I will give you that respect. And it's more than a paycheck. We will give you a bigger paycheck, but we will work together with you. To parents and students, you will have a seat at our table. We have a remarkably diverse Maryland. And I, my entire career as a civil rights lawyer and a labor lawyer has been about bringing together diverse communities. When we come together as a diverse community, the sky's the limit. And that is what we will accomplish together. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Baker, your closing thoughts. Well, thank you for uh, having us tonight and, and for this discussion. Like many of you, I was a quarantine witness uh, this past year to America's and Maryland's arrival at this fork in the road. And I couldn't sit on the sideline as a former uh, legislator and executive that's made things happen. And I'm glad to, uh, without getting involved, and I'm glad to have a running mate, Nancy Navarro, who not only serves on the county council in Montgomery County, but serves on the school board. So we know how important it is to have a quality education throughout the state. But it's not enough to simply say the right things or even believe in the right things. You have to get things done. And without the experience to be able to work at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level to get things done, it's not gonna help anyone. And so that's why we're running a grassroots campaign. Uh, we're publicly funded. Uh, that means that we're relying on the folks who are listening to this today to invest in it. And that's the kind of campaign we're going to run. That's the kind of administration we will have. And thank you for having us. Thank you. Mr. Barron, you have one minute. Thank you. All of the candidates here, we all share similar goals. We all want to improve education and wages and economic opportunity. These are democratic progressive goals. But my approach to achieving those goals is very different than the others. What they're proposing is the old playbook, rolling out one unproven plan after the next and hoping that's gonna work. We have done that. We've been doing that for decades. I mean, 20 years from now, will our children look back at this time and say, we faced all these persistent problems, stagnant wages, stagnant education, stagnant poverty, and we just kept doing the same thing again and again, or will they look back and say that at this moment, Maryland did something extraordinary. We pioneered a fundamentally new playbook, a new approach to governing based on tested and proven solutions, not just good intentions. Ideas like statewide tutoring in the early grades that I proposed, job training that's been proven effective and others. That is, and that we finally move the needle on education and stagnant wages and the rest. That's the future I want for Thank Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gansler, your closing remarks. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's difficult to overstate the stress that COVID has placed upon our education system here in Maryland, uh, both on the teachers, the staff that works at the schools, but uh, importantly, parents and students. And so we need a real leader. We need somebody who's actually led, who has the experience for the challenges of our time. And one of them is uh, recovering from COVID in our education system. We've talked about a number of things tonight that I'm, I look forward to doing as governor, uh, ending our obsession with standardized testing, uh, implementing all day pre-K, implementing universal child care, making sure our schools are safe, keeping guns out of our schools. I'm the only person in the race with any experience in criminal justice. And in fact, I was 22 years in government criminal justice. Um, we need to make sure we have mental health professionals in every one of our schools broadband in our rural areas and, and cities. We need to make sure we have a governor for all of Maryland. We need to have better school construction. We need to focus on our colleges, community college and HBCUs and an internet safety for all children. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm very pleased that I didn't seem to skip over any of you for uh, answers at any point in time. I'd like to welcome back Yvette Lewis for her very important closing thoughts. Thank you all so much. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to um, our candidates uh, for joining us tonight. I think this was such um, an engaging conversation. I don't think anyone that tuned in was disappointed. Um, and once again, I can honestly unequivocally say that we are going to have a democratic governor in Maryland because we have a terrific field 
of candidates to choose from. I'd like to thank those of you that joined us online. I know we had some technical difficulties. I thank you for your patience in sticking with us. This was supposed to be in person and having to switch to virtual uh, within the last week and a half or so proved to be quite challenging. But I think that it was worth uh, uh, doing because we did not want to cancel the forum. We wanted to continue. It was already on the calendar and we are going to bring these forums to you and we're going to try our very best to get out of this uh, um, virtual uh, nightmare we seem to be stuck in right now uh, and get together soon. But until that happens, it is our responsibility at the state party to make sure that we give you as much of an opportunity to see these candidates that are asking for your vote so that you can make an informed decision when it's time to go to the ballot box on primary day. So thank you all for joining us. I'd like to thank our sponsors once again. Um, Danielle, thank you for being an amazing moderator and for keeping things moving. But um, I gotta give it to the candidates too. You guys were really on your game, especially as far as watching the clock was concerned. So thank you because that way people really got to hear, got to hear what you had to say. And that was so important. I am looking forward to the next one. So please stay tuned. Uh, we will be sending out information about the next one. Hopefully that one will be in person, but one way or the other, we are going to continue to make sure that you see and get to know all of your democratic candidates. Thank you all so much for joining us and good night.